<laughs> As we continue to uh, prepare our hearts to receive the word of God, uh, let's go to God in word of prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight. Lord, you are our rock, and you are our redeemer. And all of God's people together said, Amen. 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 Friends in Christ, uh, I have a question for you this morning. I think it's a good question to ask, particularly in the midst of the Christmas holidays and, and family gatherings and all this different stuff going on. Uh, who here has ever experienced any tension in their family? <laughs> Right? Uh, judging from the laughter in the hands, uh, I'm going to say that's 100% of us, right? Family tension. It's something that's real. Uh, it's something that we experience uh, maybe often, maybe not very often, uh, but it's a common thing that all of us have walked through. And of course we do, right? Of course we experience this. When we spend a lot of time with people, when we spend a lot of time with people that we love and maybe people that are very similar to us, or maybe people even that are very different than us. Uh, disagreements, differences of opinion, uh, the little habits that, that don't annoy you sometimes, all of a sudden when you spend a lot of time together, they start to get on your nerves a little bit. Uh, and so there's bound to be a little bit of tension, right? We've all experienced a little bit of family tension. Sometimes it goes away quickly, Right? Sometimes it, it tends to linger, sometimes it can have really lasting effects, but other times it's just something we can kind of laugh off uh, and put to the side. But it's something that I think is a common experience to everyone here. Well, we're going to listen to a story this morning from the life of Jesus. Uh, and we're going to see his family going through a little bit of a tense time. We don't often think of Jesus having any family tension. Uh, but this is one of the stories where we get that. So I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. So Luke chapter 2, the same Luke 2 that we get, you know, the shepherds and the angels and Quirinius, the governor of Syria. Uh, that same Luke, uh, that same Luke chapter 2, uh, at the end, tells this story of Jesus and the temple. So I'm going to start reading at verse 41 and reading through the end of the chapter. Luke chapter 2, verse 41 through the end of the chapter. Every year, his parents, and his is Jesus there, every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. <coughs> why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. People of God, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, so if you are uh, a parent did your heart rate go up a little bit uh, during that story? Uh, Mary and Joseph couldn't find their 12-year-old son for three days. 
Uh, I get nervous, so Amy and I, my wife and I, we have three kids, uh, seven, three, and one, and I get nervous if we're like out in public somewhere, and if I don't know where one of them is for about five or ten seconds, all of a sudden my heart rate goes up, and I get a little nervous, and I get a little anxious, right? Mary and Joseph didn't know where, where Jesus was for three days. This is the only story that we get of Jesus in his childhood, right? We have his birth narrative, uh, and then we have uh, his baptism, beginning his public ministry when he's about 30 years old. Uh, and so uh, it's a strange story, right? It's kind of this one that stands alone in the middle, and Jesus is missing. And then uh, when his parents find him, he's like, why are you searching for me, right? But it's kind of this weird story that sits right in the midst of, of, uh, of, these, of Jesus' life story. Uh, and, and I want to invite us just to notice a couple of different things this morning. Uh, first, the first thing I want us to notice uh, is the timing of this story. I love the timing of this story. So the reason we're looking at this story today uh, is, uh, and I mentioned this a little a few weeks ago, but we are walking uh, through uh, the Christmas, excuse me, through the church calendar. Uh, it's the season of Christmas, and the way that we're walking through this is we're using something called the Revised Common Lectionary, okay? Very fancy term, but basically the lectionary is, uh, it's a three-year set of passages uh, that each Sunday is kind of assigned, and it walks you through the major events of the church calendar. So this passage was one of the ones that was assigned to today, uh, the first Sunday of the Christmas season. And I love the timing of this in the lectionary. I love that they put this here, uh, because this story takes place right in the aftermath of a big holiday for Jesus and his family, right? They've traveled to Jerusalem, they've celebrated the Feast of the Passover, which is one of the biggest uh, feasts and festivals in the Jewish faith at that time. They've made this big pilgrimage from Nazareth with family and friends, they have worshipped, they have eaten, they have seen people that they maybe haven't seen in a year, they've made this big, big deal, this big trip, and now it's over. Okay, now they're heading back home, and it's time to get back to their routine. It's time to get back to their regular lives. It's time to, all right, you can almost kind of feel Mary and Joseph going, all right, it's time to get back to Nazareth, it's time to get back to our house, it's time to get back to our kitchen and, and all our regular food and stuff like that. Maybe you're feeling that a little bit today, right? Uh, maybe you're feeling like, all right, Christmas is great and everything, but it is time to get back to routine. <laughs> it is time to get back to, to not partying so much and not doing all this stuff. Uh, and so I love the fact that we get to look at a story like this today. Uh, maybe you're even, maybe you're not just feeling a little bit of, uh, boy, it's going to be nice to get back to routine. Uh, maybe you're here today feeling a little bit of a letdown. Right? Christmas is so great. It's so wonderful. And, and uh, Maybe you come here today with some post-Christmas fatigue, right? Where you're saying, ah, this Christmas, this celebration was so great, and now uh, we're just kind of here, right? It's just another Sunday. Okay, we can be honest. We can say this kind of stuff. Maybe you're feeling this way. I don't know if you are or not, but maybe you are. Maybe you come here this morning with a little bit of post-Christmas fatigue. Uh, this is where Jesus and his family are at. They're in this post-celebration time. They're heading back home. Uh, Mary and Joseph are wanting to get back into the routine and maybe feeling a little bit of a letdown. But notice there's a difference in how Mary and Joseph experience this and how Jesus experiences this. Okay, Mary and Joseph are wanting to uh, kind of leave uh, Jerusalem behind, get back to their regular life. But where is Jesus? He's missing, he's not with them. Where is he? Luke tells us that he's in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers listening to them and asking them questions. As everyone else was leaving the temple, as the celebration was winding down, Jesus' focus was still on worship. Jesus' focus was still on God and being in God's house. Jesus' focus was still on uh, continuing what they had just experienced in the festival of the Passover. In this story, Jesus demonstrates for us uh, a dedication to God that goes beyond festivals and celebrations. Even when everyone else was leaving, even when everyone else was kind of done and saying, all right, but we're, we're finished with this now, Jesus is in the temple courts, 
sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Doesn't this set a good example for us today? I think this gives us an example of, of what faithfulness looks like, doesn't it? That a life of faithfulness to God isn't just about the big mountaintop moments. And those moments are important, okay? I don't want to disparage uh, Christmas or celebrations or mountain, mountaintop moments at all, okay? Those are important. But our life isn't entirely mountaintops, right? Our life isn't all Christmas. <laughs> Sometimes there's a Sunday after Christmas and a Sunday after that. Sunday after that, and the day after that, and sometimes there's a regular Tuesday morning where you just got to get up and go to work, right? Our life with Jesus, our life of faithfulness, isn't about all having all of these mountaintop moments all of the time. Jesus demonstrates for us here a steady devotion to God, a steady devotion to the one that he loved, the one that he wanted to spend time with. Think about it in the context of a relationship. Right? Think about some of your closest relationships, uh, family, friends, spouse, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, some of your closest relationships, I'm guessing you don't just kind of check in a couple times a year, right? Maybe you have some friendships like that. I know I do, and I value those, and those are great. Uh, but uh, So if I talk to Amy only on her birthday and our anniversary, right? Like what if the rest of the year I was just like, nah, no thanks. I don't really need to talk to you, okay? we probably would not have that great of a relationship, right? So Jesus demonstrates for us here that a faithfulness to God, a following of God, isn't just about the big mountaintop moments. It's a steady, consistent devotion. It's a cons steady, consistent wanting to spend time with the one that you love, Jesus, that was his Father, God the Father. Uh, and and keep, that, keep that pinned in your brain a minute. I want us to notice something else, and then I want to put them together, okay? So Jesus shows us first what a life of faithfulness looks like. And it's not just about mountaintop moments, it's about this steady devotion, okay? Uh, there's something else going on. Uh, there's something else I want us to notice and sit with. I want us to notice the tension between Jesus and his parents, okay? Because there's some tension there, right? We've experienced family tension. We've all uh, admitted to that already, right? But this is sort of a strange part of the story. Uh, so often, I think when we think about Jesus... Uh, we think about Jesus either as a newborn, infant, baby Jesus, right? Who's great and cuddly and wonderful. Uh, or we think of uh, Jesus in his ministry. And we think of him as this like peaceful, long-haired, robe guy who talks quietly. And, and the seas part and the crowds come and all this stuff. And, and we just have this very wonderful picture of Jesus, right? Uh, we don't think a lot about 12-year-old Jesus who talks back to his parents. That's what he does here, right? Uh, we don't think a lot about 12-year-old Jesus doing this. Uh, think about this scenario. Mary and Joseph can't find their 12-year-old son for three days. Panic. Uh, they're in a strange city. They're not at home. They have no idea what could have happened to him, right? Uh, and they finally find him. Can you imagine that moment when they see him, right? He's sitting in the temple courts, and he's safe. And he's okay. And Mary, uh, like any other mother or father would, she goes up to him and says, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Or a translation would be, Mary said, What were you thinking? We were worried sick about you. Right? And what does Jesus say? Why are you looking for me? Why are you searching for me? Didn't you know that I'd be in my father's house? Didn't you know I'd be here? Ooh, right? As parents, uh, I don't know if I'd be too pumped <laughs> about my kids saying that to me. Right? After I've been looking for them for three days. But there's something bigger at work here. Yes, there's tension between Mary and Joseph and Jesus. But there's something bigger at work here. Jesus is doing something. Already at 12 years old, Jesus is beginning to teach and redefine who his family is. He's beginning to teach and redefine who his family is. He's in the temple and he says to his mother and father, I'm home. I'm in my father's house. He says, this is where I am. I am home. Right? I am safe. This is where I should be. He's kind of redefining his family as not just his nuclear family, right? Not just his parents and siblings. 
Uh, and he does this later on in his life as well. Uh, so this is in the Gospel of Matthew. Maybe this sounds familiar to you. But there's a story told in the Gospel of Matthew uh, where uh, Jesus is, is teaching and he's told that his mother and his brothers are waiting outside to talk to him. Okay? With the implication like, all right, stop what you're doing, Jesus. Your family needs you. Right? Do you remember what he says? He says, who's my mother? And who are my brothers? Another nice thing for family to hear, right? <laughs> who's my mother? And who are my brothers? And then he points to his disciples and he says, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus always understands his family differently than just his immediate nuclear family. Even at an early age of 12, he identifies his family as more than just his parents. And yes, it was a source of tension for them. Luke tells us that his parents didn't understand what he was saying to them. He didn't understand, they didn't understand what he was talking about. But still, uh, and I love this too, we see Jesus not just staying in the temple then, right? Luke goes on to tell us, but he was obedient to them. And he goes back to Nazareth with them. And he grows in wisdom and in stature. Uh, and Mary continues to treasure all these things in her heart as mothers and fathers typically tend to do. There's this tension in Jesus about who his family is. And even from an early age, he redefines uh, who, who his family is and who, who he came to be with. And so the question becomes for us, what do we do with this? Okay, I, I want us to notice these two things, that, uh, that Jesus shows us this picture of faithfulness, that it's not just about the mountaintop moments, uh, and that Jesus kind of redefines the limits and the boundaries of his family. Uh, and, and we've heard him say that anyone who does the will of his Father in heaven is his brother and sister and mother. So what do we do with this, friends? Here's the invitation I want to make this morning. You are sisters and brothers of Christ. It's good news, isn't it? You, you sit, the person sitting here on the other side of the world from where Jesus lived thousands of years ago, you are his brother, his sister, his mother. You are his family. We are part of Jesus' family. And in turn, because we are part of Jesus' family, Jesus is faithful to us. Do you notice this? Jesus is faithful to us. He demonstrates this faithfulness to God the Father by, by not just being there in the, the mock top moment, right? He wants to stay there. He wants to learn. He wants to worship. He wants to do all of this. He's faithful to God his Father. Jesus is faithful to his family. And guess what? We are his family. Do you ever think about this? That Jesus, uh, we use that language, right? Brothers and sisters in Christ. And oftentimes we use it to talk about each other. But we are brothers and sisters of Jesus. And as such, Jesus is faithful to us. Can you imagine that? I think so much of the Christian life, we put so much emphasis on us being faithful to Jesus. Let's just sit and rest in the good news that Jesus is faithful to us, right? Jesus is faithful to you. Jesus doesn't just show up at the big moments of your life. Yes, he's there for the mountaintop and the valley moments, right? He's there for the festivals, he's there for the funerals, but he doesn't just come for these moments and then leave as quickly as he can. He shows his abiding and steadfast and faithful love to us every single day. Christmas Day, uh, the, the Sunday after Christmas Day, the, the, two, the random Tuesday morning in February when you got to wake up and go to work. Jesus is faithful to you. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. He walks with you through the ups, the downs, and the mundane, and the exciting, and every single moment of your life, Jesus is faithful to you. So friends in Christ, as we settle back into our rhythms, 
as you uh, head back to work, kids, as you head back to school this week or next week, uh, as we kind of put the excitement of Christmas behind us, uh, as we settle into these long, dark, rainy days of January and February, it's nice to see the sunshine streaming in today, but we know it's not going to last forever, right? Uh, as we settle into this, let's settle in with the truth that we are part of Jesus' family. That Jesus is faithful to us and that he will never leave us and never forsake us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, we give you thanks this morning for the fact that you never leave us and you never forsake us. Uh, for the fact that your love and mercies are new every morning. Uh, and for the fact, God, that no matter where we are, no matter where we go, uh, that you are there. Uh, the mountaintops, the valleys, the, the, the long, slow plain that we walk through, God, you are there. God, we pray this morning that you would give us eyes to see you. That you would give us ears to hear you. That we would know your love is with us. God, in those moments where we're like Mary and Joseph, that we're feeling panicked, and anxious and worried about what could happen. God, help us to know that you are there. God, in the times when we, uh, when we limit who we call our family, uh, in the times when we limit your love, in the times when we like to put boundaries around all of these things, God, help us to know that you are there uh, and that you are the one who redefines family for us, that you are the one who has made us your brothers and your sisters and your mother and father and all of these different things that you call us. God, we rejoice in your coming to earth today. We rejoice in the fact that you love us so much that you became like us and that you now never leave us and never forsake us. As we now offer our lives back to you, uh, as we give our gifts and our offerings, as we sing your praises, as we commit ourselves to walking out of this place to be your hands and your feet, God, may your spirit continue to move in our hearts. May you continue to draw us unto yourself. We pray this all in Jesus' name and all God's people together said, Amen. Amen. We do have